Welcome to The Shed. I'm Sid, Mackie's on the camera. Today, we are going to be building up this custom-painted Jet 9 RDO. So obviously, we have moved since we last posted a video. This is the Shed 2.0. It's not a shed. It is in our garage. We will post a tour of our new workshop space on this channel next week, but we wanted our first video back after this break to be kind of a special one, and I think it's going to be pretty special. We are building up my custom painted Jet 9 RDO. The full story behind this bike is on our vlogging channel, so we're not going to get into that right now. We are just gonna bask in its glory and build it up. I will be doing a full Shimano XT build, XT drivetrain. Shimano XT trail brakes, these are the four piston trail XT brakes, so a little bit more stopping power than the two piston brakes. This is a trail bike. It's 120 in the back, 140 in the front, or it will be. That's why I'm going with the trail brakes and 180 mil rotors. 180, I feel like is a good size. We don't need a 203 on this bike, but I don't know, I don't want wimpy 160 mil rotors, <laughs> even though it'd probably be fine. <laughs> a stages power meter. So the way that we do power meters are these crank based power meters from stages. So we actually sent our XT crank to stages. They put the power meter on and then send it back. That's their factory install program. Anyone can do that, so worth looking into if you are interested in training with power and you already have a crank. Crank is the first step for training with power. Can't put out much power without a crank. Hopefully you have a crank if you have a bicycle because otherwise you haven't really been riding it. And for chain ring, I'm gonna do a 32 tooth chain ring because I'm a wimp. I remember us saying that at one point and people were like, a 32, I run a 26. <laughs> yeah, it's fine. It's just because Mackie runs 36s on everything and therefore I feel like a wimp when I have a 32. Okay. You're not a wimp. This is all 12 speed as well in case anyone was wondering. So 12 speed chain to go with the 12 speed drivetrain. And this is the cassette. Which is what range? I don't know. 10 to 51, cause I'm a wimp. <laughs> Bottom bracket, headset spacers. If you've never built a bike before, these are the kind of little things that are easy to forget. So don't forget the headset spacers, don't forget your bottom bracket. <laughs> Suspension, the frame came with a, with a Fox Float X on it already, so we will not be doing that in this video. But we will be installing the fork. This is a Fox Factory 34 at 140 millimeters. So, yay in conclusion. So here we've got our dropper post lever and our dropper post. This is Fox Transfer, 175 millimeters. This is my first time trying a 175 millimeter dropper post. But I'm very excited because I have very long legs and it seems apropos. And finally tires, we're gonna do the Vittoria Sierra in the front and a Barzo in the back. And pedals, orange to match Speedo <laughs> Baldwins trail because it's a trail bike <laughs> you've forgotten three things well the handlebars and the stem yep nobody cares about those <laughs> okay so these are 800 mil bars that we will be cutting down to 740 for me and yeah that's all i have to say about that oh the wheels yep and shimano xt wheels which are still in their box and these are the m8120s so it's the xt trail version of the wheel. So it's a slightly wider rim, which makes sense for trail. A little bit heavier, but creates more volume and is good for trail riding. Less smashy smash. Shall we do it? Did I forget something else major? Whatever, we'll figure it out as we go. Someone will probably let us know in the comments <laughs> if you forgot to say something. All right, let's do it. For this task, you will need your fork, your headset, your stem, headset spacers, top cap, star nut, pipe reamer, Allen keys, crown fork race installer. What a terrible name. Star nut installer. See, that's a nice name, star nut. Pipe cutter and a hammer and a paint pen and grease. So the very first thing we always do when we start to build a bike, pull out the post, put the post in the bike, put the bike in the frame, in the stand. Post in frame, Frame and stand via post. 
I don't know. Why do I even bother talking? I don't make any sense. So we're not actually going to install the dropper post right now. This is simply just to be able to put the frame in the stand because obviously we're not putting this beautiful frame in the clamp. That would be heresy. And we like to save the dropper post for last because it's typically the most annoying part. That thing scares me every time. Put it in there. Wow, isn't it pretty? Okay, so where to start? Well, we need to track down the headset bearings. That's probably where we want to start. While Sid is looking for headset bearings, I think we need to take a second That's to admire so this frame. Isn't it gorgeous? It matches our race kits. And yeah, it's pretty much the most beautiful thing I've ever seen. I might be a little bit jealous. This goes on the fork. With the exactly. Okay. Crown fork race. Yeah. The thing that goes on the fork. With the <laughs> this goes on the bottom. Okay, so I'm just trying to think of the, the um, chain of events here. Mm -hmm. I think we will do the fork. Okay, we are gonna do the fork first. And the very first step will be putting this guy on. Like this, like that. Jeez, I've forgotten how to do everything. That's upside down. Is it? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, no, that there looks a lot better. All right, where's, that's this guy. And I just. Uh, I think you're gonna have to pop the top part of it out. Cause otherwise it's made for a smaller, you gotta loosen it with a Allen key. Okay, I see. So one of these sides is for this size fork. Yep, I'd put a little grease underneath. Decreases your likelihood of creaky creaking. Creakity creaking, nobody likes a creaky creaker. That's probably too much grease, but hey, I know no middle ground. So if you don't have one of these, you can just use a PVC pipe. That's the right size. People on the internet might get mad at you, but it will work. That look good? good? Yeah. Cool, great. I know one side of this is up and one is down, but they look the same. I think that's right. It fits on this tapered part of the crown race. Like that. Yep. So what we're gonna do, just big picture here, is put this all in, put the stem on, put the spacers that I want on, and then mark where we wanna cut the fork, and then we will cut the steer tube. So given that, it might be worth not doing grease. Too late. It's fine, but I wouldn't grease anything else. Okay. It's more likely as you're cutting it to get uh, metal shards in it, it's stuck to the grease. You know, a good step here that I didn't do would have been to take the stem out of the package. I'll just make Mackie hold this for a second. What are cameramen for after <laughs> all? I think that is upside down. Yep. I would just have a trial and error philosophy with this. The problem is then it gets kind of stuck. So you have to do both, pull both sides at the same time because it has to pull straight out. Wow, good thing I have small fingers, huh? This is really, it's been a while since I did any sort of maintenance, <laughs> so we're kind of starting over here. That's just like any other skill when you don't do it for a while. I thought it was supposed to go down in there, but no. Mm, I would have thought there would be a... Oh yeah, no, it, it, it does. It's, it's curved on the bottom. Oh, so it is. It was going in. Yeah, okay. But it's really tight. It's sealing it, basically. Okay, so you're gonna hold that for a second. And I am going to unpackage the stem and the spacers, yeah. which again would have been a good step to do before. <laughs> I just was like eager to actually do things and not just spend forever taking things out of annoying plastic packages. So we've got our spacers. I have a pretty good understanding of what stack height I want here, just based off of other bikes. Based off of the fact that you've been stealing my chair recently. <laughs> based off of the fit on this exact bike. <laughs> if you don't know, this sh should be obvious, but air on the side of too tall. So air. make sure that's all the way pressed down. You see how there's a gap? Okay, I think that's good. And you don't feel confident in where your stack height should be. Air a little bit on the high side before you've got your fork. So what I would do here is pull off the very top spacer and mark it 
because you need the spacer to be slightly higher than the top of the steer tube. Okay, so paint pens are your best friend. And this is the part where we have some trauma because Mackie once cut it too short without the stem. So I just, I suggest at this stage to just take a pause, make sure you have the spacers you want, make sure the stem is on. It was really bad. Yeah. I basically put it through the frame and then just marked it there and cut it. <laughs> Yeah, we were rushing. You were not at your best. It was a bad day. We've not made that mistake again since. I will say in our credit, we have learned from our mistakes. Oh, my nose is running so much. I wonder how cold it is. We brought the thermometer from the old shed. It's not that cold. It's 42. That's fairly cold still. It's extremely cold outside though. It's a lot warmer in here than it is out there. So we're gonna use a pipe cutter to cut the top of the fork, steer tube, that's what it's called. Can I make a recommendation? You'll find that you can. <laughs> I would remove that bearing because as you cut, little metal shards can end up falling down onto it. Oh yeah. And then there's a direction you're supposed to turn this and that you're not, and I can never remember which it is. Do you remember? I think you want to go down from where you are, except I would not do it so tight. Like you wanna do it tight enough that it's staying on, and then tighten it every rotation or two. You can also put your fork in the vise for this, but we decided not to. It cries in protest. Jeez. There we go. That's what I meant to do. We're gonna give this a little wipe down. Probably wipe off the grease that I put on, because as Mackie mentioned, don't really want all the little flakes from cutting that all over everything. And then we do this again. Uh, you want to use the pipe reamer to file it down a little bit because right now it's a really yeah. rough edge. So hold the fork sideways so okay. that if stuff falls, it doesn't fall down by your stanchions. And then you always rotate, somebody informed me, you always rotate clockwise. I thought you in the past said to go back and forth. Yeah, I was wrong. And then you do the other side on the inside or something. Yes, that was the inside of this. <laughs> it's like, hold on a second. I think the last time we got to this step, we forgot something and then we were annoyed about it. Star nut. You want to know something funny about the star nut? What? You know what it's actually called. It's not called a star nut. A flower nut. <laughs> it's called a star fangled nut. Really? I'm not making that up. That's hilarious. Which way does it go like this? Correct. Thread this, no, the other way. Like that, right? Yep. Okay. And then this is just another one of those just whack it tasks. Or is there more finesse to it? I can't remember. Oh, we'll whack it with a hammer. Oh, we can use our new hammer. We got a new hammer from Enduro Bearings. It's part of a bearing removal widget, but when it's not being a bearing removal widget, it can be a hammer. I mean, I do really appreciate tools that can do more than one thing. And while that may work, you may have to hold it up off the ground because otherwise the suspension just bounces. Jesus, that was close. Yeah, we're not quite there yet. How about now? Yay, we did it. This is one of my favorite steps actually. The star fangled nut. It is or is not. No, I like it, it's yeah. fun. Now we can finally put grease on this. It's like the fourth time I've tried to do that. Grease, grease, grease. And you wanna make sure that there's a little bit of grease either on the outer part of the bearing okay. or inside the bearing cup, whatever you prefer. Okay, I usually do it in here. This is kinda of satisfying with the grease gun. Again, we're just trying to ward off the creaks. All this grease. There she goes. This apron is just rustly in general. Like, yeah. I don't think it's the mic hitting it. It's just the actual apron is making noise. Curvy bit down. This guy. It's upside down. Is it? Oh man. There we go. So many things that can be upside down in this stage <laughs> of the process. <laughs> We're also missing the top cap. We found our top cap. So that was the thing we forgot to list. I feel like that always happens with bike builds. Though. There's always something that you're like, huh, didn't think of that. Where'd it go? Good thing I have such long arms. And then we put our top cap on. So that's why we do it 
a little shorter than the amount of spacers, if you can kind of see. Oh man, are we even going the right way? So you want to do your top cap tight-ish, but pretty much do it tight and then go back a little bit so that everything still turns really smoothly. And then we do our stem belts tight. So that is that step. Fork is on. The next thing we are going to do is put on the bottom bracket crank and derailleur. So for that, we've got our bottom bracket, our crank. In this case, we also have a power meter for the left-hand side, the chain ring. Derailleur, Allen keys, this enduro bearing bottom bracket tool. Yeah, it's the thing to tighten the Shimano like little shim guy down. And this thing to tighten down the little shim guy. This thing, we don't know what to call it. And then this, which actually is the bottom bracket tool, and some grease. This is a threaded bottom bracket. Just in general, threaded bottom brackets are a lot easier to deal with. So now we actually have a bearing press, so we could do press fit with much less um, stress and sketchy maneuvers. Everybody out. Right. Right. See, it tells you which side it's supposed to go on, which is greatly helpful. So you are going to want a spacer. This one? Yep. I think just one of those. For some reason I thought it went on the other side. We're gonna just make sure. So I Googled Shimano BB spacers and then went to images. And this one right here is what we're looking for. It says 68 millimeter, you want two on the drive side and one on the non-drive side. And for a 73, which is what we have, you want a 2.5 on the drive side. So you'll notice there's an arrow here telling you to tighten it. That's because it defies Righty, tidy, lefty, loosey. It is a righty, loosey. Next, we're gonna use this guy. This thing goes on there. Why do I not remember? Huh? Is that right? Well, you have spacers that are stuck inside there. Ah, but those supposed to go somewhere. No, you do. They give you up to three, but you only need one. Da, da, da. This would be easier if I went to the other side of the bike, but I'm lazy. Okay, she tight. Right. Cool. Awesome. Bottom bracket in. Okay, so this we are not using because we have the power meter on, so we'll probably send this to stages and get another power meter put on it for the next time we're doing bike <laughs> build. Just kind of went ahead here. So first step, put the chain ring on so you don't get your crank on without the chain ring on. This is the outside the inside. Basically the side that looks nicer goes out. I feel like on this one it's very very clear. And then it only fits one way. Yeah so you just um, try to find the big thing. There it is. What's going on here? What is your problem? There we go. There it is. And then in one of these things there's going to be a widget. There should still be parts of here that you have not. Oh there it comes with that. Hiya. Always keep a clean workspace. Okay, here we go. Now we're cooking. These are very important things to remember because we actually lost one of these once and it's been an absolute headache since. Does this need grease? Yes. At some point we want to do a video about like how to know what you should grease and what you should Loctite. Cause like, that's like such a sticking point for me with bike maintenance. And Mackie just kind of instinctively knows like, oh, that's a thing that should be greased. I mean, I know now like quite a few of them. It makes sense to me to grease things that like don't have threads, you know, like when you stick this to the bottom bracket, you put grease on it. But how do you know like which things you screw in that you actually put grease on? So these come with their own tool. You can't just use a normal bottom bracket. It's a different widget. And we're gonna do that. This goes over top of that. And you put it on very tight. This is a very tight a thing that you do tight. Because it's very annoying when your chain ring comes off while you're riding. <laughs> okay, that's as tight as I can get it. So we put our spacer on, which I had forgotten. Spacers are like the bane of my existence. <laughs> On drive side crank, got this little guy and got his spacer. So the spacer direction matters. There's a seal on one side 
the seal goes in because you want to seal the bottom bracket. Okay. I don't know if I'm going to need to loosen that bolt or not. I don't know how it comes. I think not. You need want to put this so that, you know, your, your cranks are like this and not that they're both pointed down. <laughs> so this is what that tool was for yes. that we were discussing. <laughs> I don't know what to call it, but it's kind of a necessary tool. So you want to make sure you close the space like Sid is doing, and then you tighten it down and then back it off like a quarter turn. Tighten and back. And then you check to see if it spins freely. Yeah, I mean, new bearings are always kind of sticky. And then we will tighten our pinch bolts. How tight are these supposed to be? Tight? Uh, fairly tight. I mean, 13 Newton meters. 13. Wow, it's nowhere close. There we go. And with torque wrenches, you want to do the first side and then the second side and then the first side again. Yeah. Especially with you mean pinch, like bolts. pinch bolts. Yeah. Well, we're going to put our derailleur on and then we'll set up the wheels put the cassette on before we can actually finish the drive train, obviously. Okie dokie, let's see. Probably a little bit of grease on there would be good. Okay, so if we're putting the derailleur on, you want to pay attention to this little piece. This piece sort of fits on that. This piece is resting right there. Okay. Now we've got that on, and that's on pretty tight. The next thing we're going to do is put the handlebars on and run the brakes. So for that, we're going to need the handlebars, obviously. Brakes, a Shimano disc brake cut tool, brake mount adapter if you need one for your bike. We do need this for the rear. Allen keys, always. Eight mil wrench and a torque wrench, optional but nice. Paint pen and carbon prep if anything you're doing is carbon. Let's start by just popping the handlebars on there. Very excited about this new apron. It has actually appropriate pockets. <laughs> appropriate pockets, I see. But seriously, my previous apron had these big deep pockets because it was just like a kitchen apron and I would always put tools in them and then like months later, we'd be like, what happened to that? <laughs> or more like hours later, but you get the idea. Okie dokie, so carbon prep. Why do we need carbon prep? Is that a question? A rhetorical question. <laughs> this is a rhetorical question. <laughs> it makes it rough, yep. but I don't entirely understand why that's so important. So carbon prep has grit in it, or like what feels like sand in it. So that provides more rotational grip than it would otherwise have, which means that you can run lower clamping pressures without risking the bar rotating. So the clamping pressure for this stem is only five Newton meters, which is really light. But because we're using carbon prep, then we don't have to worry about the bar slipping. That's one of the yeah. things I like about the combo of Shimano Pro bar and stems yeah. is that the lines line up and then you just want to make sure that you can see the same amount of lines on this side versus the other side. Well, I assume this line also lines up or no? Yes. Okay, so we've closed the gap, or we will have momentarily. We will go ahead and set this to five. Perfect. Actually, I'm kind of curious, like, I feel like having done this without a torque wrench a lot, I have a good feel for it. Oh yeah, see how close you are with just yeah. by feel. And once again, since these are pinch bolts, meaning there are two of them, you want to tighten one, then tighten the other, then tighten the first one, then tighten the second one. I have a general history of like way under tightening things, which is why I don't worry about like crushing my carbon bars, but I do worry about things moving. Way under. That was pretty okay. close. Did you go back to the first one? No. <laughs> Okay. It's possible that Sid has been known, as she said, to under tighten, especially handlebars. After she built my single speed, I was riding on the road for the first time and my bars just rotated like a full quarter turn. And I was like, huh, I'm going to have to talk to my mechanic. <laughs> Next phase, brakes. So this is how brakes come. If you've never replaced brakes or done a custom build, they come in two pieces because pretty much all mountain bikes are have internal brake routing at this stage. I haven't seen a non-internal brake routed mountain bike for a while. The longer one is going to be the rear brake. It is also marked on the box, but. Yeah, but some of us like to just guess. <laughs> this is the caliper. 
This is your brake line. And this is your lever. I feel like people talk about brakes, but they're actually talking about the brake levers. Brakes is like the whole thing. So we'll talk a little bit more about how these connect when we cut them down. But the first thing I'm gonna do is mount the, well, we're not gonna use these because we're going to use this. Why are you using post-mount adapter? Different bikes come stock or designed to have different size brake rotors. So if you are doing something that is not what the mounts on the frame are for. If you're doing a bigger rotor, you need a mount adapter. This frame is set to take a 160 mil rotor. We are doing a 180 mil. So that's why we need this little guy. Because it's a bigger rotor, you need an adapter to move the brake caliper farther away from the frame to fit that rotor. So the long bolt goes through the long side. And the long side goes Forward. It's even an arrow. Yeah, up, which up. is also forward. <laughs> I find this is just one of those things that's just simply tricky because everything's trying to like fly out. So I like to get it all connected, then put it on, and then try to get just a couple turns front and then the back so that everybody's on. And we're not gonna tighten these down all the way right now because once we get the wheel on with the rotor, <laughs> Her hair was in the way, so I'm holding it out of the way. Once we get the wheel on with the rotor, we will have to center it at that point. So we'll have to loosen the bolts and do this over again. So I'm just going to do this enough that it's not like shaking around and making annoying noises. And as Sid did here, you want to make sure that you run the brake line to the inside of your frame as opposed to the outside of your frame <laughs> because that protects it. Well, yeah, and also that's one of those things that you're probably gonna realize immediately, but were you to not realize it and were you to attach the lever before you noticed you had run that incorrectly, you would be very annoyed. It's got a little holdery widget. So bikes are getting long these days. We just had a little slight panic that we didn't have enough brake cable, but we do. It's gonna be fine. Um, however, what we're gonna do is we're gonna loosen this guy. And you wanna loosen it just barely so that it doesn't leak I oil. I'm nervous to use this side. There we go. So that rotates, that gave us like a whole extra inch, which we need. And this is actually where the fluid goes like up and into the caliper. So you do not wanna over loosen that. Can we tell embarrassing Mackie stories? Another one? We were uh, leading a group of high school mountain bikers. This was years ago. We were all kind of flustered at the beginning of the ride because all the kids' bikes were broken because they're kids. And like one of them was like, Mackie, my brake's making a weird noise. And Mackie's like, loosen those top bolts, meaning these to begin centering the brake. So we do have a centering brake video if you wanna watch that. that. But that kid didn't know what he was talking about, so he loosened this bolt. Instead of loosening these bolts to center his brake, he loosened these bolts, which hold the two halves of the caliper together. And so he just opened his caliper out up and dumped <laughs> fluid, all the fluid out. It was really Right good. before we went to ride the Mag 7 trails in Moab. So we learned something about how clear you have to be with children. People in general? People in general, but specifically high schoolers. <laughs> On the front, we do not need an adapter because this fork is set to take a 180 mil rotor. If we were doing a 203, we would need one. So this is just like one of those things, one of those moments. Whenever you're tightening a bolt into either the frame or a very expensive fork, just be careful that you're not messing up the threads. There are some methods, which I think we should experiment with and show on this channel. I don't think we have anything we've stripped at the moment, but. I'm sure we can find some. Yeah, if anyone has something that they've stripped out horribly that they want to send us, there are some things you can do. Essentially putting like little inserts in there to fix it, but it's a big uh, mistake in general. And again, you're running on the inside of your fork, not on the outside. The next thing we are going to do is put the brake levers on in roughly where they're going to be so that we can decide how much hose we need to cut off. We may need a pair of like dummy grips. I'm not very good at estimating this. 
you could pull them off my rip. That's a lot of work. We'll just estimate. I don't think we'll be like wildly far off. Why don't you grab a tape measure and just measure to where the brakes are? Good idea. So, so what you want to do is grab a tape measure. <laughs> okay, we need about another half inch. It's crazy far in. So I think we're actually totally fine. See, I could easily turn to there, whatever. Sorry, I didn't quite catch that. <laughs> So this is where we use our paint pen. Do you want to put your covers, lever covers on just because it's a great time to do them when you're thinking of it? Yeah, so this is a thing that gets forgot. Yeah, we've definitely forgotten this before. It's really annoying. So these guys are the bits that go eventually on like that, but they kind of have to go on the hose, up, you know, going the correct direction. <laughs> and, and it is a thing that we have forgotten. Yeah, we definitely had Very one annoying. bike that we cut and put it on there and then like electrical taped it back and it does not look nearly as good. What do you reckon? That's a little tight. That's probably pretty good. And then it goes in part way. Are you here or there? There. Uh -huh. yep. Well, really on that one, all you need to make sure is that it like goes up and has a little bit of a loop. Give it maybe a ton, uh, the other direction, probably. Yeah, right there. And I got here. Yep. So you want to do it? To here because <laughs> you want to do it to here because this sticks in, right? So you don't want to like cut it to no there and then have the it end. be too short. So basically the way these brakes connect is with a barb and an olive. We call them barb and olive. Here's the barb. The olive is actually already in the levers on these brakes. I feel like they used to come not like that. If you stick another olive in there, that would be bad. <laughs> so check to see what's going on. Before. Basically, if you have an olive in your pack of things that came with the brakes, then the olive is not in there. If you don't have an olive, then the olive is in there. This is kind of a tricky one to do completely by yourself. So got some plastic guys to make sure that we are not. That's not how that goes. There it is. Not going to scratch up our brake lever. Again, this is one where if you have someone around and you can just have them come and hold your brake lever. So this cutting tool is pretty essential for that. You can you can cut brake lines with an X-Acto knife. <laughs> I feel like we've done it before. We don't officially endorse that method on this channel. Basically, we're gonna stick this through From here. the opposite side. Oh, I just did this like three days ago. <laughs> don't really remember. Get that yellow mark lined up with where the cut is gonna go. And then the cutter part, I can never figure out which side's up on this, but I think I got it that time. There we got go. It. So we're gonna try to hold this upright because there is brake fluid in there. So if you're winging it all around. And we cut. So you can see between the fluid and the fact that it doesn't cut that easily, why you might want the specialized tool. So then we've got this guy. We're gonna have Barb sit there on top of him. Just chill like that and then they're both gonna go in here okay and then this it's going to can you see it yep cool i love that tool so then again we're gonna release this and we're gonna hold it without making a huge mess there we go the olive is in there if there wasn't already one in there you'd have to put it in there Actually, I think usually you put it on here if you're, yeah. yeah. So basically we're gonna really quickly tip this in like that, push it in. Oh yeah, this actually works pretty well. But again, if you don't wanna clamp it, find a friend, have them hold it while you screw this down. And you don't wanna over tighten this. And the key is also to make sure that the cable is pushed down solidly. Yeah. So you basically need one hand to push it down in one hand to twist, otherwise you could do it to yourself much more easily. All you're doing is tightening this thing down enough to crush the olive. And then we can put that on and then we can release. So that's one done. Now we're gonna repeat that process on the other side. So for that, you'll need the wheels. 
obviously. <laughs> Tires, tire sealant, cassette, brake rotors, lock rings, valve core remover, thingy for tightening cassette in the lock rings. Does that have a name? Yeah, lock ring tool, cassette tool, but they happen to be the same tool. This thing. Possibly a tire lever, depending on how tight your tires are. And grease. Air compressor or a pump. You're gonna need something. <laughs> Unless you wanna... <laughs> <laughs> you wanna do the tires first. Doesn't really matter. It's just then you have to try not to like touch the rotors while you're putting the tires on, so you might as well. And the first step is getting it pointed the right direction, which actually that does kind of help to put the rotor on to get the tire going the right way, because otherwise you have to think it through way too much. So this is where the cassette side, which is the right side. So that's like that, and then this needs to be like that. Rotor on the left, arrows going forward. Sometimes I like to spitefully not line it up. I don't think people know what you're talking about. Oh, there's like an unspoken rule that you're supposed to line the logo up with the valve stem. But I honestly think it's just like gatekeeping garbage because it doesn't make a difference. People are like, that's how I find the valve stem when I get a flat. I'm like, it's not that hard to find the one thing that pokes out. I never look for the logo. We typically put the tire all the way on, put the sealant in, and then inflate, or actually might inflate it and then put the sealant in. Via the valve stem? Yeah, just because that, it does seat up a little bit easier that way without the sealant. So if you have trouble getting your tires on, which I do, and I kind of feel like most women do because we just unfortunately do not have the hand strength that a lot of guys do. Get everything into the middle. Yeah, the goal is to get the bead into the very, into the center channel, which gives it more space, basically. And then you just lean back and bang. Nice. Having an air compressor is great. You typically just basically put the tire on like that and blow it up. If you don't have an air compressor, we have a video about how to seat up your tires tubeless without one, which might be helpful because it is a lot harder to do with a floor pump. But we've got a lot going on today, so we're not gonna do it with a floor pump today. Okay, and the rotor side to the left. That worked. Nice. Now we are going to pull the valve core out. I don't feel like this is necessary, but I will say if you have any doubt that something's gonna seal up, this just allows so much more air to go in so much more quickly. And at this point in our lives with tubeless, like we don't mess. We, we also don't use it. like a standard tire Right. Thing this we used like a blower to just get as much right. air as possible. So I think we're sealed all the way around. Even if it's not, it's close enough that it should be fine to blow back up. Now we let it all out. <laughs> so for sealant, we pour it into this little bottle, which looks like bad. It looks bad. So we're gonna pour that in there, but that allows us to have an idea of how much we're putting in. So this bottle should be enough for both, right? I'll just mm -hmm. fill it up and do half and half. So one trick I've learned before you put that on, yeah. compress the tire. Then when you flip it over, it mm -hmm. sucks the sealant out instead of having to like drip in. It's already trying to do that. Oh. Yeah, this is, I would say, a, a bit of an art form. <laughs> but then we're gonna, <laughs> well, this would all be fine if I had tightened that cap enough. Okay, uh, and this is why we keep the paper towels handy, a rag. The sealant really sort of destroys all of your rags, so need a paper towel for me. One other thing that's worth checking on new wheels is that this lock ring is tight because I feel like sometimes they aren't. Maybe they're fine on this one. Seems okay. It was not super tight. All right, see you in the dance. The best thing to do here is to just ride your bike relatively soon after doing this, but this helps a bit. I think now we'll go ahead and put the cassette on, and then we'll do rotors, and then we'll be well on our way. First step, 
Get some grease up in there. Creek prevention. And also because you don't want it like free your cassette freezing onto your hub. That's never good. I'm gonna challenge myself here to put the whole cassette in at once, but it almost never works. This one's all in pieces, so that's not an achievement. I think, there she goes. There we go. And that's the key, is to make sure they all sit properly, which it turns out is kind of annoyingly difficult. Like right now I think, oh no, actually that's good. But I think I should show what it looks like when it's not yeah. lined up. That one is hard to get in because you can't actually see underneath it. That's what it looks like when it's not right. There it is. The way to tell is, yeah. is to spin the cassette around and make sure that there's no difference in the height between the two. And then this one is weird. It actually sits onto that cassette ring. And then you got your lock ring on and we're gonna tighten it down. These rotors are the same. I'm gonna take off the warning label. Did you grease that? I put a little bit of grease around there, just once again, creek prevention. Is that adequate? No, let me guess, now you want more. Here's the way I think about grease. If it's something where, like by screwing it in, it gets the grease all the way around, then you just need a little bit of grease. Yeah. But there, nothing's rotating on there, so you need grease on all the parts. So like this, you just need grease in one spot. Wow. And then as you rotate it, it smears the grease all the way around. See, that's like, you teach me how to do that, then you don't have to tell me how much <laughs> grease every time. Before you were withholding that information and just being like, not enough grease, too much grease. Holding it just to be a jerk, what can yeah. I say? This is one where you want to err on the side of caution because like you slide off, you cut up your knuckles really badly. One way to avoid that danger is to put it on the ground when you're tightening it and yeah. push down. Cause then if you slip, you go like past it. Into the ground. <laughs> well, yeah, but I'd rather slip yeah. into the ground than into the rotor. A little bit of grease. I feel like it's kind of a flip side cause I always feel like I'm more likely to slip off if I do it that way, but you're right, you're less likely to go into the rotor. I find it really hard to put wheels on without a chain on. Right, it's very disorienting. I'm gonna need to take that off because it does not match. All right. Looking pretty sweet. Next, we are going to install the chain and the shifter cable and the shifter. We've got our 12-speed chain, chain brake, cable cutters, Allen keys, and our shifter. Let's go ahead and do the chain first because that's the easy part. So the first step here is getting our chain to the correct length. So to do that, we are going to go from the biggest cog around the front chain ring. We're ignoring the derailleur for this measuring part. And then there's some formula that I can't remember right now, which I could Google, but I also have Mackie here, so hopefully he'll remind me. <laughs> if you are inner to inner link, you add four. We if are you are inner, inner, to, inner outer. to outer, you add five. Okay, so one, two, three, four, five. Do you agree? I agree. So that's for 12 speed though, correct? There's a different formula for 11 speed. That's correct. Why I get confused. For 11 speed, you add two links. Unless you're um, inner to inner and then you add three. Basically, when in doubt, use Google. So now we are gonna go and put it on the smallest cog. What is something that you need to make sure of the chain when you're putting it on? Ooh, that's facing the right way. Yes, how do you tell? I think you want the, let the numbers out, so yeah, I think so we're good. Yeah, so the text yeah. should be out, if yeah. you can see it is. We went around the mountain. I came up with some moniker for this that doesn't make any sense whatsoever, and I, <laughs> I can't even remember it myself. It made like huge sense to me at the moment. You know, it was one of those where you're like, oh, you just go around the hill and over the bridge and down the waterfall. <laughs> I think it's around the hill, so okay. that's this one, and then over the fence. The point is you go over this thing, okay? Yeah. <laughs> like the rest is pretty, if you do it that right, it's kind of hard to mess up the rest. <laughs> so um, just remember to go over the fence. So we've got our quick link somewhere. We didn't lose that. There it is. <laughs> Quick links, best thing to happen to mountain biking or maybe just cycling in general. Like so the arrow is going forward, it's on the top, right? So it's actually going backwards on the bottom. This is what always happens to me with this task is just 
a lot of dropping of the quick links. If you take the chain off the front chain ring, it will make it a lot easier to connect. Oh, this one. Yeah, yeah. good call. I usually get there in the end with the other method, but it... Involves more of flinging yeah. over. So now we're on, we're gonna grab our derailleur, pull down there, and we're on. And so how I normally do this is get it to right about there. Where is it? So it's right here. Okay. So anywhere, basically anywhere from here to there. So off your train ring on the top. Honestly, anywhere from here to there. Like I said, this is easier with pedals, but the principle <laughs> and brakes that work, we gonna need to do a lever blade. Yeah. This is amazing. So Enduro Bearing sent us a kit of tools, but also came with these pedal dummies, which I guess are just for such a situation. I mean, I probably should just put the pedal on because we have it, but like, <laughs> but I want to try dummies. it. Yeah. <laughs> I actually somehow luckily guessed the right size. Okay, let's try that again. You're holding the rear brake. Yes. There we go. Excellent. Check. Chain. Check. No, oh, he comes with his own cable and housing and cable end. This is not my favorite task. I'll just like be upfront about it. So when I get look grumpy. First of all, I just want to say like, I love that it, it does, it's a thing. This XT shifter integrates with the XT brake levers, which is very nice. Cause then you pretty much just have to have one thing set up properly. Attaching it is a headache. This is Shimano iSpec. Dropper post lever is also iSpec. So you do dropper post lever on this side, you do shifter lever on this side, and they both go into the brake clamp, which is awesome. Yeah, see this just requires like a spatial awareness that I don't apparently have, because every time we do it, I'm just so confused. This piece goes in either like this or reverse of that can never get it right on the first try. I think that's right. Yeah, I actually do. Yeah, I think you're right. It was backwards. That's just really hard to picture it when you're not on the bike. This is the part that is very annoying. Hold the handlebars with your eyeball. <laughs> Bonus points if they've recently been roughly sawed off. <sighs> now we're at least in the ballpark. And then similar to the brake housing, the brake hose, the housing is going to go through this little guy. Uh, man, internal cable routing, <laughs> truly the best thing ever. When they first started doing internal cable routing, you just got into mountain biking recently, you might've missed this phase, but they were internal, but everything was just all in there, like hanging out together. Like that? Yeah. Okay, so probably about there-ish. I always like this part. It's like making a necklace. There we are. So we're gonna go ahead and loosen this bolt. It goes under like that. And that's probably gonna need to be tighter. It's just my instinct. So we're gonna go ahead and cut our cable. And we've got these little crimper things. This is a custom tool somebody made for us. Shout out to Tony. Yeah, it's pretty great. Use it all the time, but you can just use needle nose pliers. The last major thing we are gonna do is install the dropper post. For that, we will need the dropper post, obviously. The lever, cable and housing. Which usually comes with the lever. Allen keys, cable cutters, and carbon prep. Okay, so for these kinds of dropper posts, you attach at the base of the post first. There are others that you attach at the lever first. They're much more annoying. We did do a video on one of those and we'll post it up there because it's a very different process than this. <laughs> you need this little guy. I think it's technically called a cable bushing because we looked it up one time. <laughs> so you're gonna thread your cable through the cable bushing. And then this is kind of the tricky part, but you just put that down there. It's pretty easy on these posts actually. Some of them I feel like you really have to wrestle with. I'm gonna grab our housing. Dropper posts typically are where we have problems with cable routing. I feel like 
it's just because, I mean, they have to make this turn. Wow. Yeah, because they go through here and down, and then this turn right there is kind of a sharp turn compared to pretty much everything else. We're gonna try from the side, just give it a go straight up, see what happens. I'm feeling good about this. Nope, there it is, there's our sticking point. One thing I feel like we've figured out is that if you- Twisty maneuver. Well, you can try the twisty maneuver, and if that works, great. If not, so pull it out like two or three inches and then put the cable through. And sometimes the cable like allows it to curve just enough that it will then come out. Well, or the cable goes through and then you can kind of push on the cable. We know this isn't the end, but the post goes in. So don't freak out. Okay, now, yeah. Right. Oh, yes. Right. I okay. love the cable trick. So sometimes now we're gonna works. go ahead and pull this out. Pop this back in this side with a ferrule on. So putting it through the correct side. Yes. Pike is trying to run away. So we've just put the C post in to the correct height for me so that we can measure the housing the right length. So you do want to be careful to not pull too hard on the housing while you're putting that in, or you can pull it away from the seat post. One way to test is you can like push backwards on the housing and until you can tell it's like flush up against the seat post. So now I'm going to do, to put the lever on, which means we are going to pull this guy off. And then we're gonna put this on probably upside down first. <laughs> what do you reckon? I think that's backwards. Yeah. I just go with what looks right and then I flip it around. <laughs> but that's like a really dangerous concept because like along the more you do something, like you will start to think it looks right when it is right. You think on the outside or on the inside of the- You could probably go inside of those ones. I think I kind of like inside. I'm thinking if we went here, we'd be similar to everybody else, maybe then a little farther. Yeah. You really don't want to get this too short on your dauber post because then like, I don't know, you're like taking a tight turn and you're here and your seat post goes up. <laughs> All right, we're gonna mark that and then possibly you saw this coming, but we're gonna pull the seat out without pulling the housing all the way through. Then we're gonna pull this out so the cable is, I think we're safe there. Yeah, so basically you wanna make sure the cable's not in here so you don't accidentally cut your cable at the same time. Nice. Now we're gonna stick the cable through. And now we've got that all snug in there. Now we're not gonna pull on the housing. We're just gonna tuck. So when you're pulling through like this, you can pull on the cable because that's putting tension on the seat post. Because the cable's attached. Yeah, but <laughs> not the housing. Me. That's about perfect. I'm just get us straight. I'm always forgetting ferals, man. Well, you're just ready to get onto the fun part and it's like, nope, you still need to bead your little necklace. Find that later. Okay, is that a three? Four. This goes around like that. Okay, you tighten for me. There we go. That's more like it. All right, we are now done with the major building parts of the bike. We just have to put the grips on, put the saddle on, put on the pedals and then get everything on the cockpit adjusted as well as doing some bike fit things and setting up the suspension. And then I should be ready to ride this bike. We will also at some point probably be doing a ride wrap frame protector on this bike. So you will see it again on this channel. If you want to see my first ride on this bike, you can check it out on our vlogging channel. And we'll see you next week.